All right. So, um, without much further ado, today's class is basically about comparing lyrics of different artists. And um, I think uh, we went over this assignment briefly, uh, like at last time, how to scrape lyrics and stuff like that. Uh, I think everybody, like you guys, might have tried to do it. Uh, but essentially, I'm using, I tried to use the same set library as you guys, as, as I taught in the previous class, which was, uh, I believe, Beautiful Soup, to scrape lyrics. But there are much better ways to scrape things as well. Uh, in general, for most things that you want to do with the browser, there is something called Selenium, which is a Python library. And uh, that is for browser automation. So the original reason why it was made was that people wanted to test how users' experience with the websites is. So can you automate certain things on the browser? Uh, so it was supposed to be for that purpose, but it also becomes very useful for scraping information from the internet. So typically, uh, we saw HTML in our previous, uh, though we saw HTML in our previous lecture, uh, websites contain a lot of different things like, you know, they have something called JavaScript, which basically allows you to interact with the pages. And JavaScript is not very, very nice to scrape stuff from. Uh, that's because when you load, when you load a web page um, through a browser, like when I'm right now, for example, if I go here and say, you know, if I just press load, or for example, I think YouTube is the best example for it. So if I type YouTube and I open it, all of this information that has been shown here, uh, it's been shown because YouTube has confirmed that a human has tried to log into YouTube. Uh, if a automated program tries to open youtube.com, it will not be able to access all of the elements that you saw because a lot of them would be hidden away because YouTube doesn't want to show all these things to a non-human or to a computer or to a program. So you have to use Selenium to mimic uh, basically a human logging into websites. Uh, whenever, so whenever you want to do something more complicated with, with information on scraping or you know browser automation, you would need to use Selenium. So that's a good library to explore if anybody wants to build on top of something like this. But for now, we're assuming that we have the lyrics. And uh, so we'll start with, so we don't have any slides today because I think I'm just going to walk you through code and also teach you some stuff uh, along the way. Uh, as always, we have our libraries up top. Uh, we're using a few libraries here and I'll talk about each of them separately. Uh, one which is very useful is called Pickle. So Pickle is basically used for storing and reading files. So for example, I have shown everything so far saved as text files. But sometimes you want to store information which is probably not best stored as text. It may be something more complicated. Maybe your audio signal. It may be an MP3 file. It may be something else. So Pickle is like this uh, library that allows you to store. It's like general purpose storage. So it allows you to store pretty much uh, anything from text to audio to. So you can take a dictionary and you can store it. You can take a list and you can store it. So any object that you have in Python, pretty much most objects can be stored as uh, as Pickle objects. So the way to do it would be something called pickle.dump would dump it or, or save it to your disk and pickle.load would load it to your disk. So in my scraping code, once I was done scraping, I saved that dictionary uh, as a pickle file. So I, I saved it with the name scraped lyrics.p, where dot p is typically used for uh, as the extension for pickle files, just, you have, just as you have txt for text files. And uh, you would have something like pickle.load to load these files on. So I'm just loading this file here with, with pickle. Um, and we can see that it's a dictionary. So if it's a dictionary, we can look at its keys and we see that we have information for three artists there. So we started with originally, I started with just uh, Steven Wilson and Eminem, but I realized it might be fun to add another one. So I added a more popular artist, uh, another one which is similar to Eminem, but very different from Eminem in the sense that it's, she's a rapper, but I, I would argue at least that the music is very different. Um, so yeah. and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to basically write code, which is going to be uh, functions driven as we've talked about earlier, so that we don't repeat the same code for all the three artists. So I'll use, I'll define functions and I'll basically, every time I want to run something on, on the three artists, I would just loop over saying for artists and artists, and I'll do whatever I want to do for one artist. So this will be done for all three artists. This is a lot like uh, what we talked about in our India, Canada COVID uh, lecture. So, right. So, what I'm doing here is first of all, I'm reading uh, and cleaning lyrics. So what that means is I'm, if you take a look at what we have here, let's say I say split lyrics, uh, Swilson, and just say maybe number 12. So this is the text of 
the twelfth song for Stephen Wilson, and you can see it has a lot of these backslash n's, backslash t's. So we've talked about one ways to get rid of backslash n at the end of the sentence using dot r strip. Um, uh, I'm guessing you guys remember this thing. It was like this. And another way to replace that we talked about in probably the second lecture was replace, and you know whatever you want to replace followed by what you want to replace it with. So if you want to replace the word done with the word do, then I would in the string something like you know string one. This is the way to do it, and that's all that I'm doing here. But I'm using here something which is a new way to work with lists. It's called list comprehensions, and this is something which is very uh, I would say special about Python or very Python specific. Um, it essentially allows you to write code which is much more compact and very, very neat. So one way to define a list would be something like saying A equals this, and then say for I in range 10, uh, I can say A dot append I, right? If I do this, this should look like it should be list from zero to nine, right? And that's what we have. Another way to do this in Python is this. That's it. And all this is saying is that A is a list of elements I for I in range 10. And this looks complicated, I, I realize that. But um, as we're nearing the end of the course, I wanted to talk about some slightly more complicated, but you know, uh, thing, like important things that can help you write code more neatly and is used by people across the world very often, uh, especially Python coders. So this is called list comprehensions. And it's the same thing as uh, filling the elements in an empty list. It's just much more neater. And I'm using it twice here. Here I'm using it to store it in lyrics by replacing these. And then I'm also getting rid of lyrics that are shorter than a certain length. I did that because I found that certain songs were either instrumentals or there was no text for them. So if I do something like this, for example, this song has no lyrics because it's an instrumental. And that's going to mess up with our analysis later down. So I, I removed them right here. Um, and this is something you do very often. You know, you clean your data once after you scraped it or something. And this is just a form of very simple data cleaning. Uh, right. And I store all of this into these, you know, into this dictionary called artist lyrics. Uh, and I can get the lyrics for every artist by doing something like this. So this is all the lyrics for Eminem uh, for about 95 songs, I believe that's what I have. And we can see that this is a list and then I can do this. So actually one more thing maybe I should talk, talk about is here. It's called the type function. It, it's, this is an inbuilt function in Python. Um, and if you have a, Say you're trying to go through someone's code and you don't understand what's going on. What is artist lyrics? And here it's very easy to see it's a dictionary because I declared this as a empty dictionary and I fill it up. But maybe there's a lot going on and you get confused and some in the middle you want to check what, what is what this object is. You can just run type on this object and it will tell you what type this object is. So if I do this, it will tell me artists is dictionary keys. That's what I have here. I, when I did this, tell me it's a dict keys. I stored this here. And you can do this for all, for lists, for things like that. And you would in general be able to understand what you're working with. So here I can see that artist lyrics, Eminem returns. First, let's see what it is. It's probably gonna be a list. It's a list. And I can run a len on it and it tells me that it's uh, 89 songs. So let's, try to display a random song from it. And this will introduce us to another new library that we haven't seen before, which is called random um, here. So random is just a Python library that allows you to do things like if you have a list of a few numbers or a few objects, uh, say you want to randomly pick something from that. So say um, if you want to do a dice roll and you know that's just numbers from one to six and you want to pick one number randomly from that, you can use random for that. If you have a list, in this case, a list of song lyrics, I can use random.choice and I give it the list and that returns one element from that list. So another way to check is that, you know, we just declared A up here. Uh, if I do random.choice A, it'll return a number. And I can keep running this and it'll keep giving me a random number every time. And uh, this basically picks a number from the list or a, an element from the list with equal probability. So all of them have equal probability of showing up. So I'm just using this to display a random song from each of these artists. 
And there's actually one more thing that I wanted to introduce you here, and that's called string formatting. So there's a lot of new things coming up in this lecture, and I'm picking up the pace because, you know, I want to sort of, uh, I think you guys can handle it now, given all the stuff that you've done. So, so we've done string formatting, we've done list comprehensions, uh, we've done um, random, you're going to see some more stuff. But uh, what string formatting allows you to do is basically sometimes you want to say, if I say, I want to say print, you know, uh, hello, everyone. I can do that with, with just this text. But what if I am calculating a number somewhere, somewhere here? So, you know, S is maybe one, S is maybe two, and I want to, and I get, um, and I want to say this is something which is, maybe I have a function which returns a value. So something like Z is, or X is equal to S times S. So X is going to be four, but the value for S can keep changing and that can keep changing the value of X. And I want to have a general purpose statement here, which prints out the value of X. So either I can keep changing it every time I can, you know, actually print out X and I can set the value is, and then say print X and that's okay. But maybe I want to use it in a single statement. And then one way to do it is use something called string formatting. And this is a little, it's a little funky syntax, but basically you do percentage S and then after the quotes, you do percentage X. So what this tells is that this tells Python that, uh, inside this, because Python reads this, uh, the code from left to right, it says, I'm supposed to print something. Okay, what am I supposed to print? I'm supposed to print the statement. Oh, there's a, there's a placeholder here. Uh, what value do I put inside the placeholder? So it goes and finds the percentage, finds the value after that, and fills in the value here. Another, and if you want to extend this further, you can actually do something like, you know, value for X is percentage S, and S is percentage S again. And now I will have to give a list here of the values. So when I do this, it's going to give me, it, it basically goes and starts reading from left. I'm supposed to print something. Okay. This is the string I'm supposed to print. There are two placeholders here. Here's the first placeholder. Where, where is its value? It goes and finds the percentage after checks the first element, fills the value then keeps continuing. Okay. Here's the second percentage S goes and find its value and add it back again here. Now, percentage S, the S here basically specifies the kind of formatting that you're doing, the way we are pasting the information inside. There's multiple ways to do it. Um, there's something called percentage F. There are more complicated ways. Um, say you calculate a value and that looks something like, you know, complicated by like two points, something like this. And you want to round this off, print it to just something like two digits. This is something that you would use string formatting for very often. So, uh, it's just a, a nifty thing that people use very often. And I just thought that I'll give you a quick uh, sort of like an intro to it. So, right here we are printing uh, song lyrics. And now we're going to do something very fun, which is that we're going to build a word cloud out of the, these, the lyrics of these artists. So the way to do this, the way I did it is I literally just Googled make word cloud Python. And this code showed up on Stack Overflow somewhere. I copied, I copied it and I just changed the information that goes in here. Like this is literally the only thing I've changed in this, uh, in the code that I found on, on, on Stack Overflow. And as you've seen before, you can get a lot done if you can Google the right things, find it online and just adapt the code to your use case. So what we'll do here is we made a function which takes in a lyrics list. So basically it's going to be a list of a bunch of sentences. So a bunch of sentences because each song lyrics is, are a bunch of sentences and we have a list where one element of the list corresponds to one song lyrics. And if you feed it in, say something like, um, so here I'm going to basically loop through a list and that list is going to show me word clouds for the three artists that we have here. Uh, and we can see that this, the word for, for Steven Wilson is this. And the way this calculates the word cloud is that basically it looks at the words that are most prevalent and then it displays them. So the most prevalent words seem to be things like, if we leave out the boring ones, the fun ones are time, this feel, there's now, don't love, tired, night. There's also asylum here, which, which I guess even Wilson fans will pick up as a very common theme in his, in his uh, songs. And for Eminem, as expected, you see a lot of expletives here, um, which again is very expected. And if you move on to Nicki Minaj, you actually see, well, again, words that are expected in kind of songs she talks about. So, this is an interesting application for, you know, something that uh, just 
when you when you have a bunch of uh, documents for example say you have customer reviews uh, if you have a startup or something and you know you want to just find out what are the main words that people are talking about you may just want to run something like this so what's going on here under the hood is the most important piece of information here is stop words uh, stop words are basically a list of words that are basically boring and they don't really contribute much to sentiment or it's like they're important for making fully formed sentences but they don't really add much information apart from just supporting. So for example, things like, you know, uh, and the, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are stop words that should be filtered. Uh, the reason this one comes through here is probably because some kind of, it will require a little more data cleaning. Uh, but apart from that, I, I think that's the reason why it's there. So it's so important that there are Python libraries that just give you stop words. So here we got stop words from this library called WordCloud. From WordCloud, import uh, stop words. Um, and we actually filter these here. When you pass this word cloud, the, the library actually filters out the stop words that you've provided here. And we can actually take a, maybe let's see what object type it is. Okay. Um, it's probably because we haven't defined it yet. And actually that's a good question. Does anybody want to comment upon why I can't print it here? Uh, because clearly we run this code. We run this code and it works fine. I'm using stop words. Uh, but if I say print stop words, it gives me nothing. Any, any ideas for why that's happening? The scope of it is it's contained inside the function that you created. Exactly. So the scope of the function that we talked about in the last class is, is showing up here. This is something that was created inside the function. So it's not accessible from outside the function. So one way to do it is actually, you know, we could return stop words here. And now we will have to store it here in stop words. Uh, that doesn't really make much sense in this case because we're printing it out and you know, it'll get saved three times. But maybe the best way to do it is to actually just do it outside the function because this function doesn't, the purpose of this function is not to return this thing. And uh, the output of a function should typically be just something that is the final output that is that the function was written to output. You shouldn't try to get like, you know, random things in between out. The, the best way to do it would probably be just something like print, add a print statement here. In our case, we can actually just run it outside the function. So let's do that. Uh, and now when we do print stop words, it prints out. So these are the words that are being filtered. And so they, they will get filtered out from, from the lyrics. And, this is a very small list and that's because, you know, this is probably not the most state of the art um, method for getting stop words. If you use something more complicated that is more popular these days, you'll have a much larger list and uh, you could get away with that. Um, you can get away with this right now because, you know, it's supposed to be exploratory rather than something which is like a really cutting edge system. Uh, right. So another quick question about scoping. Uh, now I have it defined outside and I define it again inside. So what happens now? Uh, does it get overwritten? So maybe, you know, I'll just do this. I'll, I'll, I'll set stop words equal to some random thing like random text, right? And now if I do print stop words, it's obviously going to print random text. Now when I run this function, I run it again, um, stop words got overwritten, right? Because there's stop words here, there's stop words here. Uh, they can only be one variable one with one name. So, uh, any, any guesses of what's going to happen when I run print? Take a guess, anyone. Not a, don't worry about it. Let me find out what the answer is. Okay, since there's no takers, let's, let's just find out the answer. Uh, the answer is still random text. So, this is confusing. This variable definitely got created. Um, and that should have overwritten here. But at the same time, uh, of course, what's inside is not accessible outside, but shouldn't it have been overwritten? So the answer is that the variable can actually exist. The same named variable can exist at multiple scopes and it will be treated differently. So the one outside the function will be a global stop words variable. And that is treated differently from the one that was created inside the function. Inside the function, uh, it will first give preference to the one that has just been created. But if it is not created inside, for example, this one was not created inside, so it's accessible from outside. Uh, this sounds a little confusing and it is, it's not very easy. 
for the most part, you won't need to worry about this, but sometimes it can become a, it can become absolute hell to you know find errors in your code if you don't understand what's going on with scopes between variables. So it's just something that you learn over time and understand what's going on, just to have something at the back of your mind. Uh, if there are some errors happening that are unexpected, try to see if the variable exists somewhere outside your code or inside your code, and you maybe and that might be the cause of the problem. So it's just a very common debugging. Thing, and that's why I wanted to run it by you to sort of like tell you that this could be happening in your code. Great. So I'm leaving this as a quick extension, but maybe one way one way to make this better could be to filter out some random words. So maybe you don't want to see the word uh, and here, and you just get rid of it. You maybe don't want to see the word now or you know yeah, and you just get rid of it, and you see what remains. So that's one way to actually keep filtering your text, your data, to you see something more reasonable. Um, right. So. This, I guess, introduces you to some basic ideas. And what we're doing so far in all of this, uh, you know, text wrangling and printing out and seeing what happens is actually called exploratory data analysis. And if you ever take a data science class, uh, the first couple of lectures will just talk about such stuff. How do you load information into, the, into your Python program? How do you read files? And how do you explore to see what's going on? The reason is that uh, to be able to think of interesting questions you want to ask your data, you first need to just look at it and just make a lot of plots, make a lot of um, graphs and see what you understand. So let's look at some very basic uh, exploratory data analysis, but maybe I can just stop here and take any questions and then I can uh, sort of give you a very quick prim primer to data science on text after this. So if there's any questions. Great, so what we're gonna talk about now is, is you know, exploratory data analysis and that sort of forms the first step of data science and uh, you would do very simple things like you know plotting length of numbers or things like that a length of your data and things like that number of files what are the number of words in every file things like that so we will look at some basic stuff here I'm importing numpy uh, and I just wrote this function which returns some length statistics for, for the lyrics list so all that it does is that it goes in loops over all the long all the songs in the in the list for every artist and uh, it finds the one which is gives you the mean, maximum, and the median length of song lyrics. Uh, in doing so, I'm doing things like you know, I'm splitting, I'm appending, I'm getting lengths, I'm doing np.mean, np.max, np.median, which is all stuff that we've seen before in one form or another. Uh, this is just a quick uh, refresher of the things that you can do with, with putting together these sort of building blocks. Um, so what we get here is that the average song length in terms of number of words for Stephen Wilson is about 148 and for Eminem it's about 712 which makes sense given that Stephen Wilson writes music which is uh, you know a lot of more instrumental parts a lot of more um, music driven parts and while Eminem is a rap artist and same goes for Nicki Minaj and this number is well staggering for, for the first it's like a lot of words and uh, but it makes sense I guess given that they're rap artists they have a lot of words in their songs so yeah, um, you could do more complicated things like you can plot the distribution of their song lengths and you know you could try to understand if there's a comparison there to be made. Um, next thing I did was something called just trying to get an idea of like how rich their like lexicon is. So all I'm doing here is I'm trying to get what percentage of their words are unique words. So just measure the number of unique words that they use, divide by the number of total words they use. And it seems that Stephen Wilson uses the most uh, unique words and Nicki Minaj uses the least unique words, and that's, I would say, expected, given the kind of lyrics that they write. And uh, another next thing I, I, I saw is, you know, I, I wanted to measure complexity of these of their lyrics, and uh, I mean, this is an example that's, you know, cited very often, that Shakespeare is, is much more complicated, and you need to have a certain degree of, uh, I guess, understanding of literature to understand it as compared to pop music. Uh, I would also say that, you know, that's a common critique that people make pop music, including I, I'm guilty of saying this as well, that pop lyrics aren't as interesting or complicated or, you know, meaningful as some of the more, uh, I would say, artists like Stephen Wilson, Pink Floyd, things like that. So can we actually capture this in a numerical number is something I was curious about. And this in itself is actually a very important subfield in, in natural language processing, it seems. It's called readability of text. Uh, which, which I was, I, I, I guess, was supposed to talk about the fact that if you're, if the text is very readable, then ideally a young child should be able to read it and understand. While if it's not very readable, you probably need someone who's an expert in the field. So, 
uh, there's a whole scale going from you know 10 year old to graduate student who's who sort of has x number of hours uh, experience with the field uh, and they try to estimate this and one way to estimate this one metric for it is called uh, flesh reading ease apparently and if you go and see this library tech stack it actually gives you a bunch of such metrics and they're pretty cool to play with uh, i didn't go into the detail of each of these but they might be something which is fun to look into uh, but this gives us the response which is expected which is that uh, the readability which is you know in terms of ease uh, both mnm and uh, nikki minaj seem to have equal level of difficulty and in terms of readability or complexity and steven wilson is actually much more complicated in terms of readability or complexity of lyrics um so the way this metric works is that it's unbounded in the sense that it can go as negative as possible and the easiest sentence would probably be you know four words very simple english words something like how are you doing and that would give a very high uh, readability score and maybe one one more interesting extension could be to do actually do this for every separate song separately because artists have easier and harder songs and maybe you can compare uh, the most difficult ones across all of them because i would say that uh, for example eminem has written some very meaningful uh, complicated songs uh, for example stan i know is one of his songs which is very very uh, you know it's layered and very complicated at the same time he has some songs like slim shady which are probably probably not very complicated so maybe it's it's also an interesting idea to go into each song and see what's going on there uh, so this is you know a whole field um and so the the idea here is how did i come up with these ideas like how did i come up with the idea of running this score or why did i look at this why did i display the the lyrics lens uh there's no concrete answer for it and you know there's a lot of things you can do if you have a data set of like text in front of you for example say if you have a bunch of documents that are court proceedings or if you have a bunch of documents that are you know uh customer reviews uh what would make sense to plot there is is very data dependent so the way to understand what to ask the data is to actually just keep plotting simple things like lengths distributions uh averages looking at the data yourself and trying to ask questions if you come up with a question then the, then then you know what to code because code becomes a way to answer that specific question maybe you want to ask things like how what is the average length of a court proceeding or we want to say take a look at your say you sent a review to your customers and they've sent back a review and you want to check if people are even taking the re review seriously and and if the if the average length of a review is two words or three words you know that there's a problem um another way would be you know you may want to you may want to find the shortest court case that was ever done or you may want to find the longest court case with a lot of uh, debate between people and you can use this kind of length to just identify such simple things uh again complexity could be one way to say maybe compare a different kind of demographics uh you can try to identify your user demographics uh by looking at who cares more about filling your reviews and there's a lot of things you can do here in general and there's no one clear answer of what is a good question to ask but print out stuff keep googling keep, keep finding interesting libraries and keep uh doing things that can be done with one or two lines of code is is the is the trick to the first step in data science so i found this library last night and uh I I saw this meme and I I thought that it was a good good uh question to ask so I asked it and it's an interesting question in its own right but we won't delve too much deeper into it we'll look at some more interesting things like part of speech tagging so here's another one important way to break down text into parts is to look at the nouns the verbs the adjectives separately and people who work on linguistics have actually given us something called part of speech tagging which basically uh, tags every word in a sentence as noun verb adjective adverb they actually have a bunch of different subtypes for example a noun can be a proper noun or it can be a common noun verbs can come in different forms um and you can so these are the codes for these uh, in part of speech tagging i just made this function like the easier for us to to work with so if we pass in steven wilson and noun it actually passes in here it goes and gets the first of all it gets the so artist passes here that passes here and this is the library that we define this is the uh, dictionary that we defined before which is the clean lyrics so when i when i index this dictionary using the value for of s wilson it returns a list of all songs by steven wilson uh 
this is a way to join because this function takes in a string it doesn't take in a list so for example if i have something called you know something like so we have this mm, let me just say a b c this is a list of three numbers of three letters if i do something like this dot join a it's going to join these elements separated by this character so if, if I gave in this here, it'll do this. If I gave in something like this, it's gonna print this. So this is just a way of passing in all the lyrics of the artist as a single string. Uh, and this goes into something called NLTK, which is another library that's called, it stands for Natural Language Toolkit. And in general, this is, you know, just provides some easy functions uh, that can be used. For example, it can be used for getting position tags. It can be used for, uh, NLTK is pretty strong uh, in terms of, very diverse, but all the things that it gives are very uh, outdated. Uh, so you can do it, use it for, you know, simple analysis, first step analysis, but you won't get too much out of it in terms of very cutting edge, uh, high performing systems. So what I'm doing here is I just like take uh, the artist name, I pass it, get the lyrics, pass that into NLDK, get the tags for each word, and I loop over each word. And I just see, I pick the one which I've asked for stored that into list and return that list. So I, I, I walked over this code fast because this is very similar to the kind of stuff we've done before. Um, and then what I've done here is something which I don't think I've talked about before. So I could do this, you know, I could just say, um, let's give our variable more descriptive name nouns S Wilson. So this function, returns a list of all nouns that are present in Stephen Wilson songs and I store them into this variable. Now I can pass this here inside and make a, a plot, a word cloud. And we'll go over the word cloud in a minute, but one important thing is another way to do this is actually to get rid of this and just do this. I can call one function inside another function. And uh, honestly, this is very intuitive to people who've done mathematics because it makes sense to us. It's called composing two functions together. But if you don't have a background in mathematics, essentially all that I'm doing is when I say function, I say f of x, it takes in the input x and it gives something y. y is the output here. We talked about this earlier as well. Functions are just some, a box which takes an input, gives, it, gives out output. Now I could potentially pass this into another function. And all that I'm doing here is I'm writing this as this. So what this means is that perform function G on perform function F on X. So it passes X, it gets the value for this. And then this gets passed into this. And this is just a way to chain functions together, which is actually used pretty often when you have, you know, code with a lot of functions and you're doing more complicated things by putting them together. So, yeah, you get this word cloud. And as you can see, this is actually much more meaningful than what we had before. Like the word cloud that we had before was, had random words like uh, and the uh, Wikipedia, etc. But here it's beginning to show some very interesting things. We, if we look at just the nouns that Stephen Wilson uses, uh, we see that he talks about like, you know, love, life, place, home, a lot, lot of, he talks a lot about cigarettes and about, uh, I think, pills in general, the songs. And you can you can get a sense of what's going on here and if you, if you do the same um, for then, yeah um can you just please um explain what happens in tags so those four lines right. of code, 14 tags um, right what so let me just pull this code out and i'll run maybe i'll just pa i'll just return tags as well so i returned the tags along with the words and then now let me store it here And so B is now tags. And if I, if I look at B, let's first look at the type here. Okay, it's a list. Let's see length. Okay, it's a lot of elements. Let's try to look at one, the first element. Okay, so it first element tells me that the word somewhere has the part of speech RB. I am not sure what RB is because uh, there's probably 15, 20 different types of uh, tags. But if I keep running these, you can see that each of these words comes with, so I'll just do for I in range 
let's display the first 20 elements of this. So here are, here are the first 20 elements and these are the different types. So this one highway is a noun, it's a common noun. Um, this, there are obvious errors here, for example, awaken should not be a proper noun, but it is. Swimming is a particular kind of verb, luminous is an adjective, moon is another noun, um, so things like that. So this is just giving you part of speech tags for each of the words. That so, the, so the notations for tags is already um, part of the lexicon. I mean, I mean yes. you, should, you have to be aware of what kind of tags are used in NDK. In NDK. Yeah, so you'll have to, you know, when you run this function, you will, so if I, you know, actually, let's just look it up, NLTK post tags, let's look it up. And here is, you know, a, a tutorial, which walks us through some stuff. And you can see that here are the position tags. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, I'm guessing Rajshri, who has a degree in literature, might be able to help us out here, but that's probably for a different time. <laughs> so, yeah, but essentially, um, we have a bunch of different uh, types of tags that you can give to each word in terms of its relationships and in terms of the grammar. And this is very English specific, I believe, um, but NLTK does work with other languages as well. I'm not sure how language specific this is. Actually, uh, Rachi, are you aware of how language specific this is? I'm sorry, how what? How language specific this is, or if, like, if part of speech tagging is something which is consistent across different languages, no, like this, nouns. No, it works differently. Sentence construction works differently across languages. Okay. Yeah. So then this is, you know, very English centric and, um, but that is, that seems to be the case with a lot of uh, natural That's language true. text understanding. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Cool. So as you can see, we can, we start to figure out some interesting differences between Stephen Wilson, uh, asylum that was showing up before as a very small word is actually now showing up as a very big important word because we're looking at only, uh, okay, uh, the error here is that I just changed this function. So I have to change it back. And if I compare this to Eminem, uh, the kinds of nouns that he uses are evidently very different. Uh, and you know, I, I think that makes sense. It, it makes sense that it pulls out these words. Um, and Though this doesn't really give you any quantitative, anything quantitative, but it does start to show some inherent differences between these artists. And this could be, you know, some, some if, you're, if you're looking at a new data set, and once again, if you have, you know, uh, say you have reviews or something from your, um, from your um, customers, you can actually start plotting word clouds and seeing what's happening. What are the different nouns they mentioned? Maybe you run this, and if you have good part of speech tagging, in nouns, uh, your products start to show up. Maybe names of competitors start to show up, and then you know that you know that your your customers are talking about certain competitors. Or if you run adjectives, you can actually get an idea of how your customers define your product. So I'm giving this example again and again because um, so I was uh, TAing a class uh, in the past called Managing with Data Science uh, with, with the with the, with the Harvard Business School, and there they would ask me for very concrete applications for everything I would, you know, talk about in the lectures. And um, when I was preparing the lectures, the professors would constantly poke me to give more concrete applications. And we found that working with customer reviews seems to be a very uh, tangible example. And I, I would encourage you to think about that uh, application because it helps you understand the concepts much better as well. Uh, so yeah, think about potential things you could do with text if you have, you know, a pipeline to look at them. Here, what we have is, I'm going to just plot some more interesting things. So what I did is I actually went and found the top 20 used words in, by each of these artists. And the thing is, if I use the top 20 words used by each of these artists, this is actually very common because they're common English words. So what I did is that I went and removed the ones which are used by all three of them. So unique, com unique most commonly used words. So Unique common word sounds confusing, but the idea is that they're unique to the artist and they're common in their lyrics. And if I run this and, you know, I'm doing the same stuff over and over again in this code as well. I use here something called counter, which allows you to count the occurrences in a particular list. Once again, just Google, how do you count most frequent uh, element in list Python? If I do this, um, 
you can see it's purple because I opened it last night and you can actually see there's something called counter. I saw it, I used it. Uh, that's it. Nothing too fancy about knowing beforehand. Uh, you need to do something in Python, you will let you do it. That's all. So all I'm doing here is I'm plotting the most commonly used words by them. And this actually shows some interesting trends. So you can see that the most common words used by, 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 by symbols are like learned, comment, locked, killed, slipped, burned. Burned, I can, I can see, you know, I'm using very often in his lyrics. Um, and you can see by M and M, it's actually, you know, forgot, grabbed, cut. Uh, again, you know, words that you would expect in his songs. And for Nicki Minaj, again, very expected stuff in her in lyrics. So, yeah, this is just another way of, you know, looking at the stuff that's going on in the lectures. And there's a lot of more things that you can do along these lines in terms of, you know, plotting word cloud. Maybe let's look at the word clouds of their, you know, adjectives. And that shows, that may show something interesting. Um, You can see that he talks about concepts like being tired and darkness and luminous and bitter very often, which is expected because he's a little, you know, he talks about songs that are fairly, like I would say, sad in this, on the emotional spectrum. And for Eminem, he talks about, you know, these kinds of things, which is expected again. So you could start looking into a lot of, ah, interesting. So yeah, you can start seeing patterns and this may not be the best way to look at patterns, but it can inform certain questions. And then when you want to look into certain things, you can actually start coding things like which one's most popular um, and try to understand what's going on here. Uh, you can make histograms, you can plot. So we, we looked at plotting images before. This is another kind of plot. It's a bar plot. Um, and you can just use plt.bar to plot things. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I go in, I get the verbs and I get the most common verbs. I get the most, I do some stuff with, you know, retaining the ones that are not, that are not uh, common to all of the, that are not common to all three artists. I pick top 20 of them. Once I've got 20, I break the for loop. I think we talked about this very briefly in the past. So you can break the for loop once you've gotten enough. Um, and, and then I've stored all of these in names and heights by using dot append. Once I have these two things, I can just plot these two quantities. So here are the names and here are their corresponding heights, which tells how often they're used. And that's, that's basically about it. So, um, yeah, maybe one way to do things would be to actually divide by not just occurrence, but by like, you know, number of, uh, like how frequently do they occur? Because the number 12 and number five here doesn't, it doesn't make sense to compare them because Eminem has much more words. So of course it reaches much higher. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot that can be done here. Uh, interesting stuff. Uh, but I want to sort of touch on a very important and sort of like complicated topic, but briefly, just so that, you know, it's something that we want to explore and things we can see. Uh, what I'm talking, talking about here is called topic modeling that basically takes in a bunch of, uh, text and tries to give you the main topics that are being talked in that, in, in that pieces of text. So the, the idea here is that it tries to, at the very base of it, uh, if, if I take out all the mathematics, what it's trying to do is that it's trying to find groups that occur together. So words that tend to occur in similar places across different sentences uh, would presumably be related to each other. Words that occur together, words that occur in similar positions grammatically, would be similar meaning in some sense. And I, I realize that's very vague and I'm keeping it very vague because this technique is actually fairly complicated. It's called LDA. It's one of the ways to get topics. And again, you can see that I'm just running this code I found on Stack Overflow in 10 minutes and you can extract the code out, uh, extract uh, topics out and you can display, you, I split this, their, their lyrics into five different topics. I can do 10. I can print five out for each and it will give me some sense of the kind of topics they talk about by looking at each of these. So, you know, drugs is a topic that actually shows up very often in his lectures. It shows up here. Um, again, mental illness has been touched very often. Uh, topic concepts like love are talked about very often and they start to show up in, in, in sort of relationship with other words. And there are very, um, much more advanced, much more complicated, much more better ways of doing topic modeling. One that's that I've used very often in you know my past research is called word to wick and 
uh, it, it's complicated enough that I won't get into this right now, but I can point you to the sources if you want to you know, read more about it. But I just wanted to mention this name because it will show up the first time you mention things like topic modeling on the internet. Um, so next step, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do. You can do something like sentiment analysis, which basically takes a particular song and tries to assign a sentiment to it. A sentiment could be something as simple as positive, neutral, negative. It could be more complicated. Um, you may try to assign emotions to it. You may try to take the lyrics and summarize them into, you know, something like just one line. Can I summarize the song in one line and, you know, do a good job? I can do topic modeling like I did here. And, you know, there could be other fun extensions like working with. So this is an image from this repository of someone working with Spotify songs, trying to understand, uh, can I pick the most acoustic artist? And, you know, this is a word cloud, which I think it's pretty, it does a pretty good job. Like most explicit artists are 50 cent, two packs expected. Um, you see interesting things like, you know, energetic, acoustic, speechy. Um, and, the, and the way they're doing all of this is because the data set actually comes with these tags. So every artist, every song, gets an uh, acoustic score, a danceability score, an, uh, an energetic score. And this touches back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the class with, with Gaurav, that uh, this data set actually, so Spotify data set actually has, you know, danceability and such tags, such metadata for every song. So you can start doing things like uh, distribution of Spotify features, like, you know, acousticness, danceability, duration, energy, instrumentalness. Uh, and of course, if you have such rich data, you can start playing with it, with it to understand how different artists compare along each of these different axes. So yeah, I think this is, this was a very, I guess, fast paced, dense class because I wanted to give you an introduction to a lot of different concepts while closing some common things that are used in Python, like this comprehensions, et cetera, et cetera. And while they're at it, maybe I just quickly mentioned that we talked about dictionaries and lists. In this code, you'll find another one. It's called a set. Uh, set is another kind of, uh, it's, it's another, I would say just like lists, a list of numbers and dictionary is pairs of numbers. Set is a lot like list in the sense that it will be a, it will be a list of things. Um, but it's, it's created separately because, uh, there are some operations that are set operations that, that it can do very fast. And, and this, this, mo the most intuitive example here, I guess, is just taking intersection of two sets. If you have two very large lists. And you want to find the common elements in that. In Python, the way to do it with lists would be something like, you know, i equals maybe one, two, three, and j equals say one, four, three. And I say for i in oh, for a in i, if a is in j, print a. Yeah, there's a bug here. Okay, I think just this. Yeah. So all this does is that it, go, it loops over this list and you don't always have to have I here. You don't need to always loop over the word I. You can loop over with any variable name. Uh, and this is again a variable that is defined within the scope of just this for loop. And then once it exists, this variable is accessible outside. So if I print A right now, it will be the last value that A ever held, which is going to be three because it went through J. So if I make this, you know, seven it's going to be for it goes over this loop so this is three so it goes over each of these values one by one and if i make this seven it'll be seven right so if you have a very long list something like you know twenty thousand thirty thousand fifty thousand elements this becomes very slow uh and doing something like making a set out of these lists it's just a set, you know, um, and then set J. Now I can start doing things like intersections. So I can make this, you know, something like S I for set I, S J for set J, and I can do S I intersection S J. And it's just going to return a set of the intersecting elements. Honestly, uh, this is the only use I've ever done for set but it shows up in all introductory Python lectures. So I thought I'll just cover it here just for, just for the sake of completing it. But yeah, that's basically all that I have for today.